Good afternoon. Thank you for for being here. Thank you for the reception that you and Canadians have given a novel that is really, really hard to digest because of its harrowing and brutal and honest truth about um, a chapter in our history and an institution that was the spearhead of that chapter that left a very, very deep and long-lasting psychic bruise on our entire consciousness. Um, so it's not an easy book to read. It wasn't an easy book to write. Um, and frankly, I'm glad it's over. Um, because there's a new novel coming in the spring of 2014 in April called Medicine Walk. And um, I'll be really, really glad to be touring a different book. Um, because you grow as a writer. You grow as an author. And those things that come to motivate you and those things that come to be important and are at the forward thrust of your creativity, they have a shelf life for us too. And we want to move on and we want to bring forward another story. We want to talk about different issues. We want to talk about different themes, structures, and characters. And I've had a really, really good time sharing Indian horse in readings and conversations and panel discussions with Canadians all across the country. And it has become a, uh, a testament to what we sometimes short sell ourselves as, and that is a community conscious and very, very national spirit aware collective. And I found that. I found that the people that I least expected to embrace this book have been the ones who are at the front of the line and always the ones with the first questions, at question and answer periods. So let me tell you how this book came into being. I read a book, I think it was about 1986, called Shoeless Joe by W.P. Kinsella. And being a huge baseball fan, I gobbled it up. And I loved the magic realism, and I loved the way that he was able to capture the essence of the game. And I thought, someday I want to write a book like that. So Saul Indian Horse kind of came knocking on my door one day and introduced himself. And I said, oh, well, what have you got to say? And he started telling me. And I started to write this story that was Shoeless Joe Does Hockey, where Saul Indian Horse becomes a phenomenal hockey player and gets asked to be the native face on the Canadian team in the 1972 Summit Series. And the organizers are only going to put him on the ice for maybe two shifts at the end of one game. At the end of the first game, they're going to throw him out there, and so he can be this native guy carrying a puck for Canada. And, of course, as history tells us, the Soviets came along and they steamrolled over us in that first game. And so plans changed, and so Saul wasn't going to get to skate. So as the story went, he was sitting in the stands watching the Canadian team practice, wondering, you know, why fate would call him to do this and then not, him allow, not allow him to carry through and he starts having a conversation with this person who's sitting behind him. And they start talking about being hockey phenomenons. And he turns around, and it's Vladislav Tretyak, who was the Russian goaltender for, for the Soviet team. And they talk about how they were each hockey phenomenons in their country. And so Tretyak challenges Saul to a one-on-one -on -one shootout. And so there's this huge magic realism episode on the ice where Saul Indian Horse and Vladislav Tretyak have this one-on-one -on -one shootout, and that was the essence of the story. And there's a very, very funny thing that happens when you're involved with characters and they become a part of your own psyche and your own soul as you start to have conversations with them. And I was walking in the mountains, and Saul said to me, there's more of a story here. And I went, where? And he started to tell me about residential schools. Now, none of this means that I have a schizophrenic bent. It just means that characters sometimes inhabit you as much as you inhabit them. And I started to listen, and I found that there was more to this story than what I'd imagined at, in, at the first. And so it led me to looking more in depth at the nature of residential schools and their impact on 
Aboriginal people and consequently on Canada. And when I thought about it before I started the rewrite, I thought, yeah, that's probably really true because there are two great Canadian motifs. The one is hockey because we self-identify internationally and domestically with that hockey motif as our identity as Canadians. And the other is Aboriginal people. Only it's not so pervasive as hockey is, but it should be. Because to my mind and to the mind of a lot of people who I know and associate with, the story of Canada is the story of her relationship with Aboriginal people. From the very, very beginning of the development of this country, there was a brown face that was responsible for survival, for sustenance, and eventually for the perpetuation of this nation that we came to call Canada. There's always been that relationship right from the very first moment, and to deny that is to deny the actual history of the country. So I thought, I guess I can combine those two great Canadian motifs and see what happens. And so I started to write, and the dissolution of Saul's tribal way is very, very much a, a part of the history of Canada. So when we see his family and his cultural life dwindle away and disappear on that curve in the, in the lake in those canoes, that's a metaphorical statement about what happened to the cultural fabric of First Nations and Aboriginal communities in this country. And then the institution themselves, which to, to me was really, really a hard story to tell. But you know, when I was a young journalist in about 1979, I was sent out on a number of, of interviews and they were diverse and they had nothing to do with residential schools. But each one of those interviews over the course of about six months always wound up curving back to residential schools. And this was 1979. And at that time, our people, Aboriginal people, didn't really talk about residential schools. And certainly the greater Canadian majority never spoke of residential schools. Most people had never heard of them. But all of these conversations kept turning back to residential schools. And the people that told me those stories were survivors. And the nature of the stories they told me never left me because they were so dark and they were so sad. And at the front of the book in the acknowledgments, there's a uh, reference to Bebo, Juke, Johnny, Starr, Josephine C., Kenny O., Peter R., and Hank T. And those are the people who told me those stories. And so when I started to write about that residential school experience, I used the energy of those first-person testimonies to create the atmosphere of that school. And so what rang true for Canada was the energy of those stories. And people were able to read it and not identify so much, but to feel empathy and feel compassion for people who might have been in that situation. And the situation is that all of the Indian, all of the First Nations, all of the Aboriginal got scraped off through the inflicting of that institutional way on Aboriginal people, got scraped off. And the wounds and the scrapings and the scars that resulted as a result of that scraping away seeped and bled for generations and caused a great many more psychic wounds than the original ones when people were apprehended. And children who were in those institutions found a sense of isolation and a sense of lostness that nobody, nobody ever should have to find their way out of. And so I wrote Saul's story with that as a background. And the question is, for most people, what did First Nations people and Aboriginal people, what did they go through and, and what did they lose? The most important question people asked me was, you know, what did they really lose? And I turn always to one section of the novel that it describes exactly what they lost. And if you're reading along, it's page 53. One afternoon, during some rare unsupervised time, a dozen of us escaped to the bottom of the ridge the school stood on. A small creek ran along the base of the ridge, curving up out of an ink pot lake and into a larger one. The creek was narrow, maybe three feet across and shallow. It was a sucker creek. The fish swam up at the spawn in the bigger water and we went down there with burlap bags we'd taken from the barns. We could see the fish pushing up that water. It was thrilling. So much life, so much desperation, so much energy. We stood for a long time and just watched. 
Then some of us cut saplings and bent them around the inside of those sacks. We lowered the sacks into the water and pulled them up dripping and filled with fish. We watched the silvery brown flash as they flopped out onto the bank, their puckered mouths flapping like wet, wet kisses from fat aunties, their tails flipping and slapping against the ground. We pushed them back into the water and pulled up another sack. We did that four times. The fourth time, we stood quietly, each of us lost in our thoughts as the fish struggled for air, for life, for freedom. When we bent finally and took the fish in our hands to set them back into the water, most of us were crying. We turned as a group and began the long, sloping walk back up the ridge to the school. We walked with our hands cupped around our noses, breathing in the smell of those fish, pushing the slime of them around on our faces. We had no knives to clean them, to flay them. We had no fire to smoke them over. We had no place to store them, no way to keep them. When they lay gasping on the grass, it was ourselves we saw fighting for air. We were Indian kids, and all we had was the smell of those fish in our hands. We fell asleep that night with our noses pressed to our hands, and as the days went by and the smell of those suckers faded, there wasn't a one of us that didn't cry for the loss of the life we'd known before. When the dozen of us cried in the chapel, the nuns smiled, believing it was the promise of their God that touched us. But we all walked out of there with our hands to our faces, breathing in, breathing in. And that's what they lost. They lost that spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical contact with who they were created to be. My teachers tell me that the most fundamental human right in the universe is the right to know who you were created to be. And the corollary to that teaching is that the greatest crime in the universe is to deny somebody the right to know who they were created to be. And so what those residential schools did was they denied those native children the right to learn who they were created to be by the imposition of a whole new character and a whole new way of being. And it was tough. It was hard. And I thought that after that section, there needed to be something that went right to the core of it and said what happened. And I thought to myself, this could be a really, really long, involved piece. It could be pages and pages and pages of really, really hard, on-the-nose statements. And what eventually happened was it became about 20 lines. And they're the 20 lines that follow this in the next section. I saw kids die of tuberculosis, influenza, pneumonia, and broken hearts at St. Jerome's. I saw young boys and girls die standing on their own two feet. I saw runaways carried back frozen solid as boards. I saw bodies hung from rafters on thin ropes. I saw wrists slashed and a cascade of blood on the bathroom floor. And one time, a young boy impaled in the tines of a pitchfork that he'd shoved through himself. I watched a girl calmly fill the pockets of her apron with rocks and walk away across the field. She went to the creek and sat on the bottom and drowned. That would never stop, never change, so long as that school stood in its place at the top of that ridge, as long as they continued to pull Indian kids from the bush and from the arms of their people. So I retreated. That's how I survived, alone. When the tears threatened to erupt for me at night, I vowed they would never hear me cry, and I ached in that solitude. What I let them see was a quiet, withdrawn boy, devoid of feeling. And that was all I really needed to say after that, because of those two very, very short statements. And people ask me, why it was never more than that? Why, why wasn't this book thicker? Why wasn't there 250 pages of just rampant denunciation? Because that wasn't what it was about. That's not what it was about. It's about redemption, and it's about reconciliation, and it's about healing. It's about that amazing human capacity that we all share to reclaim ourselves, 
to bring ourselves back into the form of our being and to learn how to pray and shout and laugh and dance again. And we've seen that happen through the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, through the stories of all of those survivors, through the embrace of mainstream Canadian neighbors who have sat in those, those hearing rooms and listened to those stories and been broken down themselves, and to come together in that brokenness and embrace their brown brothers and sisters and embrace their brokenness and bring those two fractured spirits together in a hug that says, I hear you and I see you and I feel what you feel. And that spirit of reconciliation has filled those hearing rooms all through the course of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's work. And that's what this book is about. This book is about that spirit. It's about that need and that necessity for us to look at each other as neighbors and recognize each other and reach across the fence and tell each other our stories so that we can not only heal the injustices that happen through the imposition of those institutions, but we can heal this day today in this country that we all call our home. And that's what that book is about. And that's why it's not thicker. And that's why the harder and the harrowing parts aren't long and drawn out and overwritten as they could be. It's written almost journalistically written really simply and directly and concisely, and did it serve its purpose? Oh yeah, oh yeah, because the mail still keeps coming in. The letters and the emails still keep coming in from high school students who read this book in their curriculum, from university students who read this book in their curriculum, from regular Canadians who in their book clubs have selected this book to study, and the mail still keeps coming in. And it'll soon be three years since this novel came out, and it's still generating all of that discussion and that discourse, so it's still very much alive. And I think that the thing about it in the final analysis is that there was joy in this book, because when Saul found his avenue escape, he found it in hockey, and he found a joy and a purity in that game and in the speed and in the daring and in the wildness that was able to trans form him and transport him and lift him out and up and away from all of the things that that world represented it. So there had to be a section about that. There had to be a statement about what he found, that release that he was able to find in hockey. And it's on page 62 if you're reading. At night in the dormitory, when all the other boys were asleep, I would get out of bed and stand in the aisle between the rows of cots where the moonlight made the linoleum look like ice. And I'd mimic the motion of stick handling. I pictured myself barreling across the blue line with the puck tucked neatly on the blade of my stick. I would throw a broad feint at the final defender and race in alone toward the goalie who would begin to retreat slowly into the crease. I would shift my weight from foot to foot as I skated, dancing, wiggling, faking, the puck still nestled in the cradle of my blade. The space between the goalie and me would shrink and when I got about 10 feet away, I would draw the puck back behind my right leg and allow, the momentum to, and allow the momentum to bring the stick and puck forward. When the weight transfer was right, I'd snap my wrists and send the puck in a high blur into the right-hand corner, bulging the twine behind the helpless goaltender. Naturally, the force of my shot would take me to one knee. I would raise my arms in the hushed light of the dorm, my mouth would be open with glee and I would face the picture of Jesus hung there on the wall. My salvation coming instead through wood and rubber and ice and the dream of a game. I'd stand there, arms held high in triumph, and I would not feel lonely or afraid, deserted or abandoned, but connected to something far bigger than myself. And then I'd climb back into bed and sleep until the dawn woke me and I could walk back out onto the rink again. So there was those two elements, the darkness, the devastation, and the joy that comes when we learn how to be survivors. And you know, the thing about it is that throughout history, it hasn't just been Aboriginal people who found that quality of courage, that those stories of gloom and stories of doom have happened to cultures of people all across the globe. And we know through history how great numbers of them have all found that survival instinct and carried on and continued being who they were created to be. So in a lot of senses, it's not just 
a First Nations or an Aboriginal book. It's a human story because I've had the opportunity to speak to people from Kenya and people from countries in Europe and people from the Middle East who have all had something profound to say about recognizing themselves and their history in the history of Indian Horse. So it's not just about us. It's about anyone who suffered the imposition of an institution that threatens to rob them of their identity. So it's been quite the experience. It's been an amazing journey through the whole genesis of a book. And for me, it's been very broadening. It's been very healing. It's been very spiritual in nature because I've had to look at the story of my family and I've had to look at the story of my people, my Ojibwe people. I've had to look at that in the context of the dissolution and then the resolution of loss and the rewards of reclamation. And there's, a, there's another book that came out in 2011 before Indian Horse that's my first collection of poetry called Runaway Dreams. And in that book of poetry, there's a poem that I had written long before Indian Horse started to come into the world. And it was amazing to me even now that it hit it so much on the head. And I'd like to share one, maybe two of them with you. This one is called For Generations Lost. Against the sky, the trees pro poke crooked fingers upwards in praise, and even the rocks lie lodged like hymns on the breast of the earth. Way high, I hey, way high. I sing for you, even though my language feels foreign on my tongue, and the idea of myself scraped raw and aching from years of absence has only now begun to form itself into a shape I recognize. I watch you wander across the skin of this planet bearing wounds that seep poison into your blood. Your face is drawn into masks like the spirit dancers wear to chase away the night. Way high, ah, hey, way high. When I return to you, I never thought of this, a people like me who had to fight to reclaim themselves. But I've come to like this even more. Love you for the pain you bear like saints, the history of your displacement tattooed upon your faces in lines and wrinkles etched like songs in a lower register, sung from the gut. And yet, you dance. You walk the red road of the spirit and become more of who you were created to be, despite the incursions and the invasions of your minds and bodies and souls. It's a struggle, perhaps, but I've watched you reclaim yourselves, one ravaged piece at a time mend and succeed despite all odds to remain warriors who dance the sun across the sky and sing the rain down upon the land. We high a hey, we high. There is so much strength in you. And I want to tell you that if you break, do it moving forward, not away. Risk everything for the real journey is the journey itself and the only thing we take away or leave behind is the story of that trek to be told and retold forever on the tongues of those we love. You taught me that. In your lodges and your teachings, you showed me that the world remains a wild place and our only choice is harmony. We high a hey, we high. I can't replace the years they took away from you. Salve the bruises and the scars they left upon your skin Heal the seeping wounds you carry after all these years or return the disappeared ones to your arms. I can't erase that past. But I can learn to dance. And I can learn to sing in the language that's always been my own. I can celebrate in the ceremony and the ritual they could never take away. Become in my own way the expression of you before the darkness fell and after the light returned as it does now, where warriors dance the sun across the sky and sing the rain down upon the land. Way high, hey, way high. And I had no idea when I wrote that how it would entwine so naturally with the story of Indian Horse. But looking back at the two, the two of them now, I see how 
twinned they are in spirit and intent. And then the other thing is that it seemed like I was being psychically prepared to do that story and to make that journey because the next poem in the collection is called Ojibwe Graveyard. And it gets a little bit even more pointed. Beyond here is the residential school where hundreds of our kids were spent, sent sprawling face first against the hard packed ground of a religion and an ethic that said surrender. And when they couldn't or wouldn't, they wound up here, just beyond the gaze of the building that condemned them to this untended stretch of earth. Everywhere, the unmarked graves of the people whose very idea of God sprang from the ground in which they're laid. There is no fence here, no hedgerow, to proclaim this as a sanctuary or even as a resting place. Only bitter twirls of barbed wire canted wildly on posts, rotted and broken and snapped by neglect. Unlike the marble and granite headstones that proclaim the resting place of nuns and priests devoted to the earthly toil of saving lost and ravaged souls for a God and a book that says, suffer the children to come unto the light that never really shone on them, ever. Even the wind is lonely here. Clouds skim low and the chill becomes a living thing that invades the mind and there's nothing, not even prayer in any human tongue that can lift the pall of dispiritedness created here for them to sleep in. My brother's grave, somewhere in the rough and tangle of the grasses, can't be seen. Only felt like a cold spot between the ribs and a caught breath sharp with tears. Bitterness. What they slipped onto the tongues of generations removed from us, like a wafer soaked in vinegar. They say we Indians never say goodbye, but I doubt that's true. No people in their right minds or hearts would cling to those sad effigies, the knowledge that someone once thought that they were less than human, deserving nothing in the end but an unmarked plot of earth beneath a sullen sky, the weeds and grasses stoked by wind to sing their only benediction. So we bid goodbye to nuns and priests and schools that only ever taught us pain. Keep your blessings for yourselves. In the end, you're the ones who need them. And that's a lot stronger than anything that's said in Indian Horse. And I think I vented <laughs> well enough before I started to write the novel. Um, and it's amazing to me these days how that poetry and the prose that became the novel of Indian Horse were so completely ready to be born in me at the time that they were. And the novel became a fusion of both of those things. And I found for my own self as a writer that at the end of Indian Horse, I bore much less anger and, and much less resentment and much less questions that I had what I started. So is the creation of a work of literature a redemptive process for its author? Sometimes. Because in my case, it was. In my case, I don't expect anything for myself these days except my own acceptance and belief that we are all moving forward together toward a collective rekindling of the idea that this whole country was built upon. The idea of all of us working together for a common goal and purpose. As it's stated at the end of the book when they're playing hockey on the ice and there's 18 people that come to celebrate Saul's returning and one of them asks the question, how are we going to do this? And he says, what? And the other one says, play the game. And he says, together, like we should have all along. And I couldn't have found a more perfect ending for the novel than those words, because that's what it's all about. I mean, it's fine and well for those of us who have a fundamental education in the real history of the nature of Canada to espouse and declare and make grand, eloquent speeches about the wrongs that were committed and, and the things that need to change now. It's all well and good to be able to say those things. But they only take us part way on the journey of reconciliation and reclamation. What we really need to say is yes, yes, yes this happened, 
Yes, this caused a collective bruise in our psyche and our consciousness. Yes, it was a shameful period in the history of Canada. Yes, a lot of people were hurt. And yes, I feel shame and anger and bitterness about that. But yes, we can work together and do something about it. Yes, we can admit that this story is part of our Canadian story and help each other move beyond it. Yes, we can find reconciliation. Yes, we can heal each other. That's the kind of discourse and the kind of conversation we need to have between ourselves if we're going to work together to create a better history than the one that we had prior to this. Yes, that's what we need to be saying to each other. So, Indian Horse is finished. A friend of mine once told me that a book is never finished until it's read. And in the very beginning, as a young writer, I didn't understand what he meant. But now, with the total deluge of emails and Facebook posts and Twitter tweaks um, that come from Canadians of all stripes and backgrounds and colors, I know what he means. I know what he means, that all of the intent and all of the purpose and all of the spiritual energy that goes into the creating of a book like Indian Horse means that it's only ever finished when someone reads it and closes it and it has a profound emotional and spiritual impact and they find themselves saying that one spiritual word. Yes. That's when the book is done. And it's been done for a while now. And it's time to move on. So keep your eyes open for Medicine Walk coming in April from McClellan and Stewart. It's a story about displaced fathers and displaced sons. It's a story, again, of, a, of another more individual um, dissolution of history and its reclamation, and it is something else. And uh, it's coming through McClellan and Stewart, and you'll hear a lot about it before it gets here, and it's going to be one of those books that will bring me back here, probably sometime in 2014 or 2015, because the creative spirit keeps on flowing. It always draws a writer and an author into areas that maybe hadn't planned on going in the very beginning, but we get there nonetheless. So stay tuned for that. And with that, I want to say thank you for your attention. And my favorite part of this process is where I get to ask you for your questions because that's where I start to learn about where you are. And hopefully in the discussion of those questions, you get to learn more about where I am. So any questions at all? I know there's someone around here with a mic that can... Uh, bring it to you so that you, everybody can hear your question. So if you have any, please just raise your hand and they'll find you. Yes, right there. I probably don't need the mic. Um, how long did it take you to write Indian Wars? Well, it was two, sec two, two separate pieces of effort because the first one with the magic realist, Saul does... Shoeless Joe. Um, that didn't take very long. It took about maybe three or four months. Um, and then the other story vein came along, and that took about a year, a year and a half of really broadening the scope of what was there. You'll know, notice through a reading that Vladislav Trechek doesn't make an appearance at all in the novel because at that point it became less magic realism than just realism. And so collectively, probably two years. Um, in the two different streams of writing. Yes? Okay, I need to ask this question, but I just need to know it's burning in me. Is the Iron Nun for real, or was it really just a metaphorical construct or something that came out of the stories that you heard from the survivors? I heard stories about a device just like that. I heard people tell me about spending nights alone in the cold and chill of a basement of one of those schools and hearing rats scurry and crawl around and how there wasn't any room for them to move around or even hardly turn and they were just children so that that device couldn't have been very big um, it was called contrition um, and kids were sent there because they weren't being <laughs> or being molded properly or, or the molding wasn't taking or, or whatever but it was called contrition and I heard that story a couple of times uh, from different sources and from different, about different schools. So I know that there was something like that likely in every one of those institutions because the intent was to break 
them. The intent was to remove them from their entire identity as Indian kids and make them something totally different, Cre recreate them in another image. And in everything that I ever read from that, um, from, the, from the book of the Bible, that there was only ever one power who could do that, and that was God himself or creator himself, and nobody had any business even trying that. Um, but they did anyway, and they used all manner of devices like the Iron Sister to try and make that happen. I work for the, uh, I work as a writer for the Indian, for the uh, um, Aboriginal Community Foundation, so, which is um, all of the residential school and all that. So I read a lot, hundreds of government documents and letters and everything that just really backs up. And worse, what Richard, what is described in Richard's books, like pins in the tongue to stop, and like all kinds of terrible, terrible things that like Richard was very, like he said, uh, insights. Mm -hmm. Could have been worse. Yes, ma'am. This is really just a comment. The one problem I had with the uh, Indian horse, it was too well written. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that the story was so good that it, I just, it's, I'm going to have to go back and reread it and reread it because I knew when I was flying across the pages that, uh, I mean, I find your writing wonderful. But I just wanted to turn the page and see what's going to happen next. <laughs> so uh, I thank you. But that's the only trouble. Read it slowly or go back and read it. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you. I, I think, you know, in, in answer to that, um, I, I referred to it earlier about how all of this could have been a whole lot more pronounced and, and a whole lot more deliberately brutal and deliberately harrowing, but I didn't think that anybody needed that. And you know, one of the things that really prepared me for the ground of being a novelist and the ground of being a poet is all the years that I spent as a journalist. Um, and, in that, and in that way of writing, you learn how to be sharp and simple and concise, and you learn how to trim all the fat from every sentence, and you learn how to, to say exactly what you mean and to mean what you say. And that really served me well in terms of Indian Horse because nothing was overwritten. There's very little flab in this novel at all. And I attribute that to journalism. For, for all the years that I wrote for television, for radio, and for newspapers, that conciseness and that brevity that results in perfect clarity really served this novel well. Um, and the reason that it served it well was because there wasn't a need for overwriting. There wasn't a need for any purple prose or, or any authorial grand gestures. The story itself and the nature of the story was enough to carry it. That was its heart. And so it didn't need to be written in, in great, big, long, passionate discourses. It just needed to be presented almost matter-of-factly. And it was. And I, I find that funny as a writer because you always want to be poetic. I want you to go, oh, wow, that was amazing. But you harness that. You rein that back in. And you learn to work for the story itself. And if there's any aspiring or perspiring uh, writers in the room, um, that's the, the biggest advice I can give you, is if you work for the story's sake all the time, um, it will spare you the anxiety and the inner debate about how much you should write or in what way you should write it because you're writing for the story's sake and not your own. And again, I think that particular rule served me really well in, in the writing of Indian Horse. Yes? Do you, um, amongst the other books that you've written, do you have a favorite? Yes, I do. It's the one that's on my keyboard right now. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and I don't, I don't think I'll ever change that. I think that, that the book that I'm currently creating is going to be my favorite because I'm filled with it. My whole spirit and my whole consciousness and my whole, every fiber of my being is directed toward the gestation and the delivery of that baby. And it's a real act of consciousness and it's a real act of 
spiritual engagement. So in my mind, my favorite book is the one that I'm writing now, and I'm only like 65 pages in, uh, but it's a humdinger. <laughs> uh, but in the real world, in terms of what's on the shelf these days, what you can go to the library or, or the bookstore and find, I think that my favorite book of all 13 is Ragged Company, uh, which if you, if you haven't discovered that book, uh, is a story about people who, who suffer chronic homelessness and who by turns of fate and circumstance find themselves on the streets of cities um, suffering through all of, the, all of the nature of the world that comes to encompass homelessness. And they win $13.5 million in a found lottery ticket. And the novel spins on the question of whether that huge turn of fortune has within it the power and the potential to change not the quantity of their lives, but the quality of it. And the story, the story works on that one premise, that one question. And it's the story of four chronically homeless people and the one, strangely enough, jaded journalist who becomes their friend and what he learns through watching their journey and what they learn in sharing each other's journey through this application of fortune. And I think that that's, that's my favorite novel. And, and I don't know, maybe after this one's finished, the one that's on a keyboard, that'll be displaced. But up to now, up to now, it's been, it, it, it is ragged company. So if you have a chance to read it, uh, please pick it up because here in Vancouver, um, homelessness is still a great thundering issue. And maybe I'll tell you this story. I didn't know that I was going to, but maybe I will. Yesterday morning, I had the opportunity to go to the downtown east side. And I went there because that was part of my history, too. Uh, I've been homeless. Uh, I've slept in alleys. I've slept behind dumpsters. I've been hungry and, and ate, ate out of dumpsters in the wee small hours of the morning. And I never forget that. One, because you can't, because it's such a, it just comes to fill you, the smell of concrete at your nose and, and the feel of your own skin when you haven't been able to wash for five or six days. It just doesn't leave you. And I go down there as often as I can to, to walk among those people and, and to remind myself that there are issues in this country that still need to be addressed and written about. And I go down there too because I see in each one of those faces and, and each one of those people the person that I used to be. And I go down there to bring the person that I am into that world and to maybe affect a small change if I, if I can. And I always buy cigarettes and I always fill my pockets with, with loonies and toonies. And I stop and I talk to people. And if they need something, anything that I can provide with my pockets full of that stuff, I give that to them. And I also went down there because there's an organization that opens its doors early in the morning and Aboriginal men uh, come in and they pick up hand drums and we sit together and we sing and we pray uh, and we reconnect in a really meaningful way around those drums and I went to have that experience again. And it was amazing. There was, there was eight people, eight men from the street who came in and we sang about three prayer songs and an honor song at the end. And we had a collective prayer uh, after the first couple of those songs went and I had the opportunity to listen to real people say real prayers. And they were probably some of the most profound prayers that I've ever heard in my life because they were gut bucket honest. And they were praying to say thank you for the freedom and the dignity to allow them to have something real in their day before they went to fix, before they went to drink. They could touch one thing in their life that was real for that one small moment. And it was a profound experience for me. But the most profound thing happened after we were finished and we were leaving. And I was shaking hands and I was handing out some cigarettes and, and sharing change. And one of them, his name's Eddie. Eddie looked at me and he, he met my eyes and I could tell that, that he was real. And he said to me, he said to me, me with the wallet full of money, me with the artistic life, me with the, the home and me with everything that he didn't have, in his position of lack, he asked me, am I going to be okay? Am I going to be okay? And that just about sent me into this emotional <laughs> place. And I did. I left and I went to the alley and I had that moment 
on my own. But he asked me if I was going to be okay. And I realized at that time that, that the nature of those characters that came out in Ragged Company wasn't just a fictional construct, that those kind of people live down in the streets of our city. Uh, and I can never forget that, so I think Ragged Company is always going to be that. Because of guys like Eddie. Yes? Uh, I'm in the First Nation Studies program, and uh, this year we're doing a class on reconciliation, a student-led seminar. And we've been talking a lot about themes that you brought up today, and I've read Indian Horse and really loved it. And, um, and Sal Indian Horse finds healing, and like you said, the saying yes to, to rebuilding that relationship is really important, but how, how do you see that sort of jiving with the really hurtful uh, narrative of just get over it and, and, and that kind of side, which in some ways is part of, of the TRC and, and is the closing of that door, so is, I was hoping that you'd be able to speak to that. Well, the truth is that, that we don't need to rebuild that relationship because we never built it in the first place. We've never had that opportunity to build a relationship. We've had the imposition of things like the Indian Act and, and the, the, ig, the rampant ig, ignorance of what those treaties and those agreements stand for. And we've had the total absence of our part of this country's history completely denied and not put into textbooks. We know the names and the stories of Radisson and Grosaye, for instance, but we don't know the names of the men who led them across the prairies. We hear about David Thompson and Alexander Mackenzie, but we don't know the names of the brown men and women who showed them those rivers and showed them those portages and allowed them to, to go discover this country. And that's a missing part of our history, and that's a missing part of that relationship. So we, we don't have anything to, to rebuild but we certainly have 147 years of living together with which to frame a new relationship to carry us all forward. So I think that in the, in the wording itself of particular questions and in the wording themselves of particular observations, we need to go back and correct the language. And so it's not a, it's not a question of rebuilding a relationship. It's forging one in the first place. And if we can do that, if we have a government who uh, is courageous enough to allow that to be the framework, then something actually can be changed. And in terms of reconciliation, it's funny the way that English is structured because they, they, they tend to, to start such big words uh, with re. And uh, I find it funny because what it, what it means is that conciliation has already happened to some degree, but we want to reconciliate it. And I don't think that we need to reconciliate. We just need to come together in a spirit of conciliation, in a spirit of consensus and recognition of each and every one of us as an independent creative energy created by the one loving and nurturing spirit that sent us all here, and to recognize that in each other and speak to that with each other, whether you're a government official or whether you're just a a neighbor talking to a neighbor to, to approach each other in that same light of recognition and be eager and willing to hear the stories that we tell each other. And if we can do that, if we can enter a spirit of conciliation, A, we get to build a better relationship, and B, we never have to reconciliate ever because it's conciliation and coming together that frames the focus of our ongoing steps together. And we never have to look back at that because we start building a better history from the day we start taking that other focus to the day that we end our story here collectively. I don't know whether that answered your question, but it felt good to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, I guess this is an uh, appropriate follow-up question. Uh, we just had the TRC here in Vancouver about a month ago. Um, and, yeah, I, had the, uh, I got to experience it. Um, I was just wondering if you got to experience it what you thought about it and what you think it means for conciliation. I wasn't here, but I had friends who were here. And I think for me, the, and I've written about this in a newspaper column, the, the biggest image and the, and the biggest result of, of those hearings, particularly the ones that were here, were 70,000 people 
arm in arm, walking across a bridge in the pouring rain, carrying signs and saying to the rest of Canada, we're here for the spirit of this reconciliation. We believe in this great mending. We believe in this coming together of collective energies to frame a better, a, a better history, to start a pathway to serve towards something more and something more inclusive than we've ever had before. 70,000 people, not just Aboriginal people, not just Métis, not just Inuk, not just Dene, Dogrib, Blackfoot, but Hungarians, Romanians, Scots, English, Canadians from every background were walking across that bridge in the pouring rain together. And if that's not an indication of what we can do when we listen to each other, I don't know what is. And I think that the whole nature and the scope of, of, the, of the DRC work is directed toward that eventuality of all of us walking in the pouring rain and saying, we want a different Canada. We love our country, but we can love it more if we move into this process of all-inclusiveness and non-exclusion. Because that's one of the things that's a spiritual truth in our Aboriginal teachings, and that is that unity can't happen if exclusion is part of the process. So we need to include every voice. We need to hear everybody so that the idea that we come out with with the shining hope and the shining promise that this country can be and can work towards is only possible if we hear every voice. Not just Aboriginal people, not just residential school survivors, but homeless people, marginalized people, impoverished people. All of those voices need to be included in that shining vision or else we don't have one. And that march in the rain was reconciliation in action. And I think that the more people come and hear the testimonies at, at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings until it finally winds down, the more you're going to see examples of that. Because that's 70,000 people saying yes. And that's a really, really powerful statement. Okay. Uh, what's your relationship uh, to hockey? You said you're a baseball fan, but what's like, like historically your relationship to hockey? I played hockey up until I was 39. I played at all different levels, and I played in different parts of the country, and it was my joy. It was my joy in the wintertime um, because I couldn't play baseball on the ice. Um, but, yeah, I was involved with the game for 39 years. And I probably would have kept on playing, except my cousin took off with my hockey gear. And uh, I didn't want to spend another $800. Um, and that was the end of my time. But I never forgot what it feels like to be on the shining white glory of a rink, like I said in the book. Um, or the feeling of, of a whole bunch of young men leaning against the boards, huffing and breathing like Mustangs uh, when you're playing on the, on the, in the frozen outdoors like we used to do in Saskatchewan. Um, and I never, ever forgot the, the freedom and the abandon and the wild joy of it. Um, so, yeah, I, there's only one way that you can write a book like this, is if, is if you actually know what that smells like and feels like and tastes like. And uh, so hockey's been, hockey's been part of my, my, my joy and my passion all my life. Yes? discussion you've mentioned a few times about becoming who the creator meant you to be and would you say that writing is who you were created to be and could you speak a little bit about how you found that path? I think writing is a part of who I was created to be. I think it's maybe one of the bigger parts. Um, I don't think it's the whole picture because I do a whole lot of other stuff. I teach and, I, and, I, uh, and I'm, I'm becoming more and more of a ceremonialist and a, and a ceremonial teacher, for lack of a better word, maybe a, a leader, a guide. Um, and I'm, I'm learning how to be an uncle and, and a brother and a father and, and a grandfather. Um, so there's all of those elements that, that who I was created to be. I'm learning how to be a better friend. I'm learning how to be uh, a better lover. Um, I'm learning how to be all of these roles that life asks me to be in a better uh, and more engaging and fully functioning way. But writing is certainly one of the larger ones. And when I was small in a foster home in, in uh, northern, the northern part of Kenora, Ontario, and northwestern Ontario, I was filled with a, this all-encompassing loneliness because I knew that I didn't belong in that home. It was really easy because nobody else looked like this. 
and none of the people in that neighborhood looked like me, and so I knew that, that this wasn't my home, and I was lonely. And one day while I was playing in the bush, because that's where I felt less lonely, I found a cave behind some, some pine trees. And I went into that cave, and I sat there, and I realized that this was pretty cool in there because I didn't have to measure up or I didn't have to qualify. And so I kept on going back to the cave, and I put paper and, and candles and blankets and stuff in there that I'd sneak away. And I would sit in there in the afternoons, and I'd write stories about what I imagined my life would be like if I was in the home that my family was from. If I had a real father and a real mother and real brothers and real sisters and dogs and cats and all of that stuff, I wrote stories about what it might be like. And that was my first, uh, my first writing uh, exercise, and I never, ever forgot that. And later, um, when I was in my teens and I hung out almost exclusively in libraries and got completely swept up in the culture of books, I remembered that uh, period in my life. And I kind of cultivated the dream then of thinking, mm, maybe I could make a book one of these days. Um, but never really acted on it, never really knew what to do until I connected with my traditional people again. And they were the ones who told me at 24 that my function and my journey in this reality was to be a storyteller. Um, and so they were the ones who gave me the cultural and the philosophical and the spiritual underpinnings to start becoming that. So. Uh, it was a gradual evolution. There wasn't one moment when I just sat there and wrote continuously because I could feel this complete outpouring in my spirit. That's what happens now. Um, but in the beginning, it was just a gradual path of discovery, and eventually I found it and I claimed it. Well, I want to thank you again, and there are books at the back. If you don't have uh, a copy of your own, there's a table, and if you want your book signed, I'm more than happy to sign for you. Um, so again, thank you for your attention. I'm glad you were here.